rose. Amen. Christ is alive. Amen. Christ is risen. Right. And that's the story that we try and keep to and humble ourselves because we you could get to yourself be above yourself, couldn't you really? But we must keep our feet, as we say in England, firmly fixed on the ground. We're here not to worship the place or even this beautiful garden. Christ comes when you come into the garden. You bring him in, you worship, you pray, you sing and you share in communions and you share in fellowship together and you bring the Lord in the garden with you and you meet him here also and that is such a wonderful thing and the more people that do that the more we love it which way right, that, that went right over the top at one time can you see how it's, it's arched out and here and I want to trace my finger so please watch very carefully there's a knob out there then it comes down down, across, up, then from that area that's cut out there it comes down and then it has a hook on. Could you go out? There's a, yes, please come out. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 we had you like Thank her. you so much. <laughs> I appreciate that. And of course, there's the channel. And uh, all these things that you see on the exterior are very interesting. The, the anchor, they say, is, is, is the, ch the early church developed a system of sign language to share with each other that they were Christians. And an anchor was one of the signs that they used along with the sign of the fish. You know that, don't you? Well, the anchor was another one. And that comes from another biblical saying, the anchor of my soul. Okay? So why was there an anchor, a Christian anchor, carved here way back for about 400 years after Christ had died and risen. Why does it look like an arch? Well, we don't really know, but uh, one of the theories that scholars have put forward is that this place was important <coughs> very soon in the early Christian era, and people came to worship here for some reason or other. Now, why would they come to worship here? Well, maybe that's another pointer to this being the place. When you go inside, there's another cross on the wall, which looks quite modern, but it's not. It's a thousand years old, etched into the side of the wall, which says on it in Greek, Christos, in Greek letters. So somebody else came here to worship God, to worship Jesus in those days, long, long time ago. So we're starting to think, well, maybe this is the place. Maybe this could be the place. And there's now, we, I want to go, well, perhaps I'll just explain to you before we go there. We think that the wall, that the, the, the opening was about that high, and that's dropped down, and this, you may be saying, well, why is those modern looking blocks there? Well, we think that there was a lot of earthquake damage, uh, and we think that may have been part of some earthquake damage. It's, uh, so it is, yes, that, those blocks do look quite modern, but I assure you, when Kathleen Kenyon, a famous ar um, archaeologist from Britain came, she dated our tomb at the first century. And she said it was a typical rich man's tomb. Well, we, that doesn't need to be a great mind to tell us that it was a rich man's tomb, because if you're a poor man, you didn't get a tomb. So you had to be a rich man to pay for somebody to come and hack you a tomb out of the rock. Normally it was a family tomb. If you come over just a little bit, folks, then our other group will get it. Normally they were family tombs, and they, they made this provision, because as you know, in the time of Jesus, life was very transitory. Things didn't always work out very well. People didn't live as we do today. And consequently, they made provision. They got themselves a tomb, so they could lie in them. Now, the tomb wasn't the final resting place, usually, for the Jew. You know, they, they waited until the bodies decomposed, and they collected up the bones and, and put them in little caskets, which they call ossuaries. Okay? Now that's enough of the history. Let's go back to the Bible because we want to we want to know the Bible story, don't we? Now I want you to imagine it's the first Easter Sunday. Now are you there with me? You're imagining this. And what's happening? Some dear ladies are coming to the tomb to complete what they'd started on on the, on the Friday evening but couldn't finish because of Sabbath and they were scooting along, you can imagine them, can't you, with their bottles and things carrying along, and they're saying to each other, who's going to move the stone away? Who's going to move the stone away? Who's going to move it? They 
hadn't brought the brawn, you see. Sometimes many years. Well, sure Not all the time. <laughs> but they, they hadn't thought of how they were going to move the stone. But then they say you can imagine them walking down here, coming around the corner, like you might do in down your street, and you suddenly see something different to what you'd expected. There's a new removals ban outside, and people are moving out, you didn't know, you know? And they come here stone which would have covered that whole area which would have weighed about three tons it's been moved and as they come to the tomb they get closer and closer and they look inside and inside they see a man in white a young man in white on the right hand side mark's gospel mark's gospel an eyewitness account gospel we know an eyewitness account gospel on the right hand side now i want you to look at my plan. this is the plan of our top a typical rich man's tomb in the first century, except for one thing. There's a number of tombs in this area, and this particular area here, area two, can you see that? It's called the weeping area. Okay, number two, the chamber, weeping chamber. Okay, now the weeping chamber was where relatives went to say goodbye to their loved ones. Now, when the ladies looked in, the young man in white was on the right hand side, which fits our tomb perfectly. Now, if it was in a tomb, some of the other tombs that are around, okay, that was here. Now, if it had been this kind of tomb, the Bible would have said, and they looked inside, and the young man in white was right in front. Did they not? But he was on the right hand side. Here. Now, this is where the body would have been laid. It's known as the edicule. Okay, that's where the body's laid, and it's notched out a little bit. Can you see that little notch? Yeah, that's for the feet. And they say that. That wasn't finally completed until they got the length of the body that was going to lay in it and then they notched it out. Now look at the rest of the tomb. Not complete. We think it's only ever been used by one person. It's never used by the rest of the family. And history tells us that Joseph Barathea, once Christ had risen from that tomb, although it was his, although he'd had it notched down, it probably cost him a lot of money, he never used that tomb again. So only one person laid in the tomb. So, biblically, this fits the Easter story perfectly. So if it isn't the tomb, it's a very, very, very good likeness to the one in which Christ actually was laid and from which he was. Want any uh, rival site? Well, that's why we try not to rival them. We don't rival them. We don't say this is the site. What we do say is, as I mentioned a moment ago, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to see where your Lord may have risen from. Looking inside the garden to this blue place that the moon body of Christ was